In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. That's how I begin every sermon, isn't it? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. With those words, and with the sign of the cross. If you've been listening to my sermons for a while, or if a pastor in your past used the same pre-sermon invocation, then it may be some time since you've given that much thought. It's just what the pastor does. On the other hand, if you're fairly new and you haven't seen this done in your former churches, it may still give you a bit of a jolt or a thrill, reminding you that, as Dorothy said, you're not in Kansas anymore. But a new kind of place, an evangelical place to be sure, the first church to identify itself by that name, actually, and still the one that holds most purely to the Evangelion, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, though we're more commonly known as Lutherans because everybody liked the name Evangelical. An evangelical church, but one that has preserved a reverence and an appreciation for many of the good understandings and salutary traditions from the first 15 centuries of the church before the Protestant Reformation, traditions such as making the sign of the cross, which the newer kinds of evangelicals have disowned as superstition or even somehow as idolatry. This is a church where you can hear a sermon on the sign of the cross, which is also a sermon on the baptism of our Lord Jesus and on how his cross and his baptism save us utterly from death and hell, by faith, not our works. One sermon, one evangelical and traditional sermon that ties all of this together in a shining gospel package. A sermon like you're about to hear. Traditions are a necessity of communal life, especially any sort of communal life that you want to pass on from generation to generation. Traditions are not as clear or as sure as sacred scripture And sometimes they have gone awry, requiring correction from the inspired source. But they are good for us, and we can't get away from them. They are necessary enough that if we do away with the old ones, we shortly replace them with new ones. The drum set and the guitars will make their first appearance in worship, because why not? The organ's an instrument. These are instruments. The organ certainly can't be uniquely holy among instruments. Sure, let's try it. Why not? And then before you know it, that's the new tradition. Go back to the organ? We're not that kind of church. This is how we do things. Making the sign of the cross is a tradition. It's an old tradition. It's a very old tradition. According to the ancient historians, the last great Roman persecution of the church began in AD 303 when the emperor Diocletian had diviners who were performing an augury for him, scanning chicken entrails in order to discover something about the future, something he meant to base policy on, and the augury didn't work. They didn't get a readable result, and the diviners blamed it on some Christians who had been nearby making the sign of the cross at the time when they were invoking the gods. The Christians had done this to invoke Christ's protection against the demons that they figured would be present at such an augury. And this was the last straw for the pagan emperor. They're interfering with serious matters of state now, and he began to persecute them savagely. That's 303. And we have evidence that it was well established, at least in some places, more than a century before that. The oldest traditions can be strongest and best. There's a reason why they have survived in constant usage. But it's still not scripture. So we ask, what's it for? What does it mean? And maybe doesn't that story about the diviners and the Christians suggest that even that early, it was a superstitious practice, that they were making it in order to be protected from the presence of demons. They thought somehow this sign would protect them, like a charm or a counterspell. Well, anything can be used in a superstitious way. The Lord's Prayer can be used in a superstitious way. The bread and wine from the Lord's Supper can be used in a superstitious way. The name of Jesus can be. In the book of Acts, 
unbelieving exorcists used the name of Jesus to attempt to cast out demons to their harm. And the Israelites once used the Ark of the Covenant as a battle standard, thinking it would win them victory, and the opposite happened. The sign of the cross has no doubt been abused, but that it has been abused is evidence for nothing more than centuries and centuries worth of men and women and children who have held it dear. Nor should we assume that the Christians in that story from 303 were using it superstitiously. Maybe demons were present, responding to the invocation of the pagan gods, and maybe they weren't. But if you thought demons were near, you would probably pray for protection too. And that's what the sign of the cross is. Or rather, that's one of the two things that it is. It is a prayer, and it is a confession. And it is anchored in the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ that we commemorate today. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. John the Baptist had foretold the coming of a greater one than he, who would show up soon and with a greater baptism, a baptism that would give the Holy Spirit. Jesus now shows up and receives the baptism of his forerunner. And by the work of the Holy Trinity, this baptism is, is transformed into that prophesied greater baptism. When Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended on him, and as the Gospel of John adds, remained on him. And the Father spoke from heaven to publicly claim Jesus as his one true beloved Son. Then later, when Jesus sent his disciples into all the world to preach the gospel and baptize those who believed it, he told them to perform this baptism in a way that paralleled his own, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All three persons of the Holy Trinity were present when Jesus was baptized, the Father speaking from heaven, the Son, the Spirit descending from heaven to fill and dwell, and the Son being baptized as well as also being the word as ever that his father spoke. And this is true also of your baptism. The Holy Trinity, all is involved. You stand, or you're cradled in your parents' arms, in the place that Jesus once occupied. And God the Father speaks his eternal word over you through the pastor. And the Holy Spirit is given to you to indwell you and make you an eternally living part of Christ's eternally living body. And the sign of the cross is made over you, perhaps for the first time. And that sign is not essential to your baptism. If you were baptized without the sign of the cross, as I was, that doesn't undermine the sacrament. Your sins are still washed away. You are still united with Christ in a death like his, so that you shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his, to use the words of our epistle. But the ancient church used the sign of the cross at baptism, and we continue to use it that way today, because it graphically shows what is happening according to the word of God. The one receiving baptism is told, receive the sign of the holy cross upon your forehead and your heart, to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. And then the water is poured three times in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And in this, you are given the triune name of God. You are given the strong name of the Trinity. You are washed with pure water and the Holy Spirit and the cross is placed upon you like a brand is pressed on a steer. This child, this man, this woman belongs to God. Demons, hence. And more dramatic than the branding image, it means this child, this man, this woman, who has never physically hung on a cross, has yet been crucified. Mighty lively, you might say, for someone who's been brutally executed. But it's true. St. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. 
the best of both worlds. Or better than that, because the life that we have after baptism is the everlasting life of Jesus Christ, not the doomed-to-die life of Adam. Nevertheless, I live, Paul says, and immediately adds, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Through his Holy Spirit, who is granted in holy baptism, descending on you invisibly as he once descended on Jesus in the form of a dove. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The sign of the cross at your baptism means that you are dead. But you're dead with Christ on the cross. And we know the second act of that crucifixion, don't we? It means that you are dead to sin, but alive to God. It means you are credited with having died the death that your sins deserved. It means that you are credited also with the perfect merits by which Christ deserved to be raised again. It means, in the language of our Old Testament reading, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. Christ stood in the Jordan River for you. I said earlier that when you were baptized, you were standing in his place reenacting his baptism, but he stood in your place first. There was no reason for him to be seeking the forgiveness of sins. John the Baptist had nothing that he needed. He had nothing to repent of at this baptism of repentance. He went to and through that river in your shoes as your representative for you, professing himself to be your brother, your husband, your own flesh and blood, your guardian, your atoning sacrifice to bear the chastisement that brings you peace. The river, the water, doesn't just symbolize purification. It symbolizes danger. That's how it's used in our Old Testament passage, a symbol for deadly peril, a threat equal to fire. When you pass through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. Jesus did this symbolically at the Jordan where there was no literal danger. Then he did it in dead earnest reality on the cross. So you receive the sign of the Holy Cross when you are baptized to make that connection as clear as a ritual can make it. He was baptized and crucified for you. You are crucified and baptized with him. When you pass through the waters, when you walk through fire, he will be with you. He's already with you. When you die, he will be with you. You won't die alone. You will die with Christ. You will be laid in his tomb. You will rise with Christ. The flame shall not consume you. So when we make the sign of the cross, this is what we're confessing to the world to the demons, to our own stupid selves, because we constantly forget. I am baptized into Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Sin can't lord it over me anymore. Death can't destroy me anymore. And we do it in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, because when we were baptized, that name was given to us. The Father owned us to be his children, as surely as he owned Jesus at the Jordan. The Spirit came to be our illumination and our life. The Son's flesh and righteousness and death and life became our own. And I said it was also a prayer. A prayer based on that confession. A prayer like it was for those Christians at the emperor's court as addressed to the world and to ourselves it's a confession as addressed to God who is our father through that baptism and the work of Christ it's a prayer Lord I believe in your Christ and his cross I believe that my many sins have been covered by his blood and washed away by water and the word the cross is my armor I stretch it over my head and over my vital organs I am crucified with Christ. I can't get any deader. <laughs> Nevertheless, I live. 
and I'll live forever. The prayer is, fulfill all these promises to me, Lord. I believe your word. Deliver me from evil. Whether that evil is demons or human persecutors or false friends who will lead us away from Christ or fire or water or strokes or cancer or auto accidents or our own doubts and shameful lusts and selfish pride. Lord, I believe in you. World, I believe in Jesus. Dull, rebellious flesh, you have been redeemed. And you have the Spirit of God living within you. So cut it out. And Lord, show up for me, as I know you will. Be my God, my provider, my protector, and my great reward. You have redeemed me. You have called me by name. I am yours as surely as Jesus was yours, although he was yours eternally. I am by your word, your beloved son. With me, you are well pleased. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen.